we don't want to have access to our users' data at all. So we're not sending user data to our servers. We are not collecting data. We actually go so far, we don't even collect any telemetrics. People, I have a really cool interview today with John Fontetsner, who's the CEO of Vivaldi. Vivaldi for me has always been an interesting project because I've been a little bit unclear on whether it's technically open source and how privacy and security respecting it is. And so I figured it would be awesome to bring on John to help talk about what Vivaldi is all about, who's their target audience, whether or not they're open source, what the history is with Opera, their whole Mastodon home server, company ownership, business model, Chrome security updates, what's going on on iOS, especially in light of the EU stuff. So many things. I mean, it is a great interview that really kind of helped open my eyes a little bit to Vivaldi, but also just the web in general. We do talk about just general problems on the internet. Really good interview. Let's dive right into it. Thanks for coming on, John. Um, we had to really, <laughs> I had to, we had to practice a little bit for how to say your last name, um, Fontensner. That's pretty good. All right, awesome. Um, so John is the CEO of Vivaldi, and I really want to thank you for your time today. I know that this is um, taking time out of your valuable day. I also want to thank everyone who's listening to this. Um, do you want to give some background behind yourself and Vivaldi before we start talking about um, the privacy and security of Vivaldi, what your target audience is, some of your features, and then we can also talk more about what you're trying to do and your overall goals. But let's just start with you and why you're even here. Sure. Uh, I mean, in my case, it goes way back. Um, I started working with the web in 1992. Um, I founded my first web browser company in 1995, which was Opera. Uh, I then quit Opera in 2011. And two years later, I founded Vivaldi, uh, co-founded Vivaldi, uh, which is making web browsers as well. So I've kind of been making web browsers since, actually, I started coding in 1994. And so I, one of my questions for you was Opera, because I actually was a little bit confused reading into this online. So you used to work for Vivaldi, or sorry, you used to work for Opera. And what made you want to leave Opera and start Vivaldi? And I've also just, you know, like people just say random things online. So it's kind of hard to tell like what's real. Not. Is Vivaldi a fork of Opera or is it just similar to Opera? No, I mean, the, the way that, I mean, uh, I was working at Opera, obviously, for a very long time, uh, 17 years. Uh, I mean, I was co-founder and I was CEO of the company for 15 years. Uh, and uh, I guess there came a time when we were disagreeing about the direction. So I was more inclined to continue growing and focusing on the needs of the users. And some of the investors I had, they were more concerned about, uh, okay, we should take an exit before it's too late. The company is doing too well. We should take an exit before, before it's too late, basically. So there was a disagreement on this. And after fighting the investors for seven years, I got tired of it and I left the company. And uh, I was not really uh, planning to start another browser company. Uh, so I, after two years after I left, then I saw that my old company was going in a very different direction than what I had thought. Uh, they basically threw away all our code that we had spent 17 years writing or 19 years at the time writing, uh, and they changed the philosophy of the company. And, and to me that meant, okay, uh, I can build another browser company without feeling I'm competing with myself. Um, and there was basically a need. I mean, there was a lot of users that were unhappy about the direction. And, and as a company, we had had a lot of support from end users helping us grow the company. Uh, so I felt that I owed them. We owed them. So we had to build a browser for them that was more like the old Opera, following the same design philosophy and, 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 and the like. So no, we're not a fork. Uh, we, we didn't have access to the old code, sadly. Uh, so we, we're kind of starting starting fresh. Yeah, um, that's really impressive. I'm glad that you saw a problem, took initiative on it, and now you're still fulfilling a need for people who were probably thinking the same way about the situation as you were. Um, as someone who I don't think I've ever even downloaded Opera or used it. I've only used Vivaldi a little bit. Do you mind kind of enlightening me or anyone else who has never used Opera behind what was the selling point of Opera and what people were upset about? Like, what is the philosophy changes that you're talking about that you're still trying to um, uphold via Vivaldi? I think the principle that we had at Opera and that we have at Vivaldi is adapting to the needs of the end user, uh, actually providing a lot of options and a lot of flexibility. 
Um, this allowed us to go and become the number one browser on mobile, for example. Uh, we were the number one mobile mobile browser in big parts of the world and actually worldwide at the time. Um, we built the browser for gaming consoles and various other things. So we built into the Nintendo Wii, into the Nintendo DSi uh, and, and, and the like. So we were kind of getting into all kinds of devices, but also just providing a much richer set of functionality than you would find in other browsers. And that's kind of when Opera went in a different direction, they basically removed all the functionality uh, and there was nothing left basically. So you have a browser that has the most functionality and the first browser they released after this change didn't even have bookmarks. So it, it went pretty far. So, I mean, if you look at what we are doing, if you look at, for example, uh, now if you talk about Vivaldi and what we are doing now, I mean, we have built in, a, I mean, a mail client, calendar, news feed, we have built in a note-taking function. We have tab handling that you found, can't find anywhere. We have workspaces and tab stacks and the ability to basically control everything, how it looks uh, to the minute details. Um, we provide the browser on Windows, Mac, Linux. We provide it on Android. There's an iOS version in the, that is coming soon. And we have become the number one browser in cars. So how does that work? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it basically what happened is that uh, Polestar. Uh, oh, it's Polestar. Came, okay. It, it started with Polestar. So Polestar came to us and said, hey, we, we, we would like to provide a browser in our cars. Uh, and Google doesn't provide it. So it, basically, they're using Android Automotive. But Google didn't provide the browser. So they were asking, okay, can you do something for us? And we said, sure, we can do that for you. So we provided the browser. And then obviously there was more that were asking for the same. So the first was Renault. Uh, then there is soon going to be launch in the Mercedes-Benz E-Class. Uh, and then there's been announcement with regards to the Volkswagen Group. Uh, the first cars will be some Audis. Uh, I think about seven models that will be launched shortly. Uh, so we've taken a market that is pretty fresh. I mean, browsers are not so common in cars yet. Um, and I mean, we're taking the lead there. And this is the kind of thing that we did at Opera, where we took the lead on things like mobile and game controls and, and the like, where, I mean, mobile sounds obvious today, but I can tell you when we started working with mobile, there was kind of question, who wants to browse on mobile anyway? How, how, how what date was that? Because this might be before, um, like I was more active on things. I mean, this is all the way back into. I mean, we we started looking at this probably back in like 1999. Oh, okay, so uh, back in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, early days for us, and and so basically, what was happening is uh, in, in the Opera days, we we had provided the browser for some uh, clamshell computers, some very small Symbian-based computers, and then basically the smartphones started to take off, and we provided the browsers for uh, for the smartphones over the time, which was uh, kind of the Symbian-based phones, the, the Microsoft-based phones, and the like. Um, and then actually, we found a way to provide our browser on just about any phone. Uh, we provided a, a kind of a, a proxy solution uh, where we ran the browser on the server side and would communicate with a, menu, with a small application on the phone which would mean that we could actually browse full web on just about any phone of any size screen and the like. It was uh, it was pretty crazy, but we kind of enabled the internet for a lot of people that otherwise would not have been able to access it, which was a great feeling. That's awesome. Yeah, no, and I was not expecting to talk about cars today either, so that was interesting. I didn't know that Polestar used Vivaldi within um, its infotainment system. That's super awesome. Um, and... I guess to kind of summarize, because we've talked a lot about past now and you're kind of leaning more into, you know, Vivaldi, maybe more today. Um, I've downloaded Vivaldi and just this is personal. It was a lot for me, but it seems like you have to you have a lot of features and functionality and control. Um, so is that your target audience? What is your target audience for Vivaldi today? Like who watching this video, if you were to describe the person watching this video that you feel Vivaldi is best for, who is it? Well, I think, I mean, just about anyone can use Vivaldi, but the typical user that goes in our direction is someone that spends hours each day on the internet. 
that is maybe using it more than to just kind of scroll social media, but it's using it maybe for work or for play, kind of in, in, in different ways. So a typical Vivaldi user probably has a lot of tabs open because we have tab handling, which allows you to have hundreds of tabs open and still organize them. Uh, we, I mean, we, we have all this other functionality like mail, calendar and feed reader and the like, but you can use the browser without using all the functionality. It, it's just there if you need it. So it's, it's, it's kind of a way to get away from big tech. So if you're wanting to take the step away from big tech, we provide a, a really nice way to do so. But if you want to, you can set it up really simply. I mean, if I'm setting it up for my mother or something like that, I'll put a few speed dials uh, available in the first page. I'll put in uh, a few other settings like standard Zoom levels and the like, and then it's ready to go for her use, right? So it, it, it's really a question of the individual. And I, I think you'll find that it's technical users that download us first. I mean, people that are not afraid to download software to their computers, uh, given that the operating system vendors have a tendency to try to warn you in particular if it's competing software. They really don't want you to do that, uh, in particular Microsoft. Um, so if, you, if you're downloading something, I mean, you start there and then what we're finding is those users, they tell their friends and family, okay, you should be downloading this. I'll set it up for you. Um, basically some basic settings, some privacy options like tracker blocker and the like, enable that and then go from there. Got it. That makes sense. Um, I didn't need to do more testing with Vivaldi. I think I might have, and I don't know if this is advice or anything, but when I used it, I was overwhelmed. <laughs> um, I opened it and it was like really powerful. And for me personally, I like things to be super minimal. I just want like three options for things. Um, and so I have seen people online though that were like, oh, just do these few things. And actually it's a super minimal, like light experience. That's more like a standard web browser as well. But um, yeah, that's something I need to test because I've actually, a lot of people have told me that a lot of really hardcore fans of Vivaldi within our own communities have been like, Henry, you didn't give enough of a chance to Vivaldi because here's like all the cool things it can do. So it's something I want to look more into myself. I did want to ask, uh, before we start talking maybe about privacy and security and more of that realm of things, um, I always like to ask uh, business models, maybe more about your team. Um, it's a very important topic because we've seen in the past how, um, especially if venture capitalist funding can influence projects and make them go the wrong direction, especially in the privacy community. And there's the constant issue of needing to make sure that these privacy projects um, or any projects that have a focus on privacy exist in five, 10, 15 years. Because otherwise, you know, imagine getting used to Vivaldi and then it's gone next year. Um, so what's your business model like? Um, and how do you guys structure yourselves as a structure yourselves as a company? Is yeah, and I, I agree with you. I think those are very important questions. And as I mentioned, I mean, there's a reason why I left Opera, right? There was a disagreement with investors. So the difference with Vivaldi, we don't have any investors. It's it's basically all the funding is coming from me, and all the employees have shares. So that's kind of how we organize it. It's basically it's owned by the employees. Uh, when it comes to the business model, uh, it's basically we we do deals with search engines and some of the bookmarks. Uh, we get some cut if you order through, say, uh, an eBay or uh, an Amazon or uh, or a Booking.com or something. So it's basically bookmarks that we include. Uh, and they're visual bookmarks, speed dials. So if you utilize those, then we get a little bit of revenue. The revenue we make per user per year is not a lot, but then we are not in a, we don't have a business model where we gather user data in any shape or form. And we've been actually very, very, very clear that we think that's wrong and should actually be banned. Right. And I really appreciate that. That should be a philosophy that's treated more seriously by more browsers. But um, if I'm not mistaken, because if, I don't know if a lot of people think about the fact that their browsers are free. It didn't used to be that way, which I'm sure you could also talk about. Browsers didn't always used to be free, um, but I'm sure you can comment on this further. But um, most other browsers also have similar revenue models with search engines and things like bookmarks and any kind of content as well, right? Yeah, it, it's. I mean, I would say that that's the the normal business model for browsers in, in today. 
Now, I mean, some of them are also search and uh, kind of uh, search engines and, and 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 ad companies and the like. So there's a difference there to to what extent there is the potential for gathering data and the like, uh, because that's not our model. But yes, it is the normal way for browsers to earn money. I, you're right. I can talk about the history. <laughs> I can go all the way back. <laughs> yeah, if you really want to. I mean, I'm sure some people would find it fascinating. I mean, if you, if you want to go back to the, the Netscape days and the like, when uh, Microsoft was wanting to kill Netscape, at the early days of the Opera, we were actually having a CRM model. You would download the browser for free, and then you would pay if you'd like to keep it. Uh, and that worked fine. But at the same time, Microsoft was desperate to stop Netscape, which had the same business model as us. So they integrated uh, Internet Explorer into Windows, and then they made it impossible for OEMs to include uh, alternative browsers. Uh, and and uh, that's kind of, it killed Netscape. Now, interestingly, the uh, Department of Justice went after Microsoft and told them that they needed to stop this. Now, what they did then, I, I think, is maybe even more monumental in some ways, because what they did, they basically paid OEMs to include the browser. So you had two choices as an OEM. You could get Windows without a, a kind of Internet Explorer, and that would cost one figure. Or you would get, pay less if it included Internet Explorer. So you can say that's the start of crapware. So now, and, I mean, now all the and now all it's the Candy computers, Crush Saga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Now all the computers are including software that you don't need. But before that time, there was actually a difference between computers and you might actually select the computer based on the software that was included. Wow. No, I didn't know like that full complete history. And I'm sure other people didn't either. Um, I think and it's not like I'm purposely tracking our audience, but YouTube does at least try to guesstimate ages and like our core age range is between like 20 and 30. So I think people on the lower end of that are probably around where I am. Um, they're, that's probably all news to them too. So that's all really good information. So thank you for the insight. To dive more into the privacy and security, which I think is an extension of, of business models. I think that a lot of people don't make that connection enough that a lot of times the reason why there's so many privacy issues is um, actually directly related to finances and business models because that's what a lot of the modern internet runs on. So how do you ensure the privacy and security of your users? Let's just start there. Um, regarding just you as Vivaldi, as a company, how do you treat the data first party of your users? Is there any kind of policies you have to protect your own users just from you collecting their own data? Let's not talk about third parties yet. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, for us, that's a very important point that we don't want to have access to our users' data at all. So we're not sending user data to our servers. We are not collecting data. We actually go so far, we don't even collect any telemetrics, with meaning kind of how you're using the browser. Now, I, I know some of the guys on the design side wouldn't mind having a little bit of information on how people are using the browser. And I don't necessarily think it's terrible to collect that data. And I think all of our competitors do. But we've just decided, okay, we don't even want that. We we just don't want to know what people are doing. Personally, for me, it's a little bit about, okay, instead of uh, looking at statistics, I'd like to just listen to what users have to say and take their advice on how how products should be made. So we listen because it's in an individual requirement and that goes into kind of our adapting to the needs of every individual user basically taking the input from our users and providing the flexibility that they can get it their way. Now, um, so it, it's, it's a way of thinking. So we try to avoid having access to data from our users. This includes things like sync. So when it comes to synchronization, I mean, you may have Vivaldi in multiple devices you want to synchronize. Uh, we synchronize through our servers. Um, we have two passwords. Um, one of them is basically logging into Vivaldi, which you can use for our other services as well. Like if you're using our blogs or forums or Vivaldi social and the like. The uh, other password is the encryption password, which is only on your computer. So it basically means that we won't be able to read your data on our servers, even if we wanted to. And that's kind of how we'd like to keep it because yeah, we, we don't want to have the data. Got it. So you're saying that every user has their own private key for synchronizing between different Vivaldi accounts. Yes. If someone downloads Vivaldi, they don't touch any settings, and they don't open a Vivaldi account, 
is there little to almost no inf because you said you don't collect telemetry so what kind of data is even submitted to vivaldi from just someone who just doesn't even set up a vivaldi account uh, I mean, the only information we get is basically we're counting users. So we would get a ping that allows us to count how many users we have and where in the world they are and more or less hardware. That's the level of information that we get. Got it. And I'm guessing from what I've been able to tell, that's pretty universal across almost every other browser as well. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I, again, everyone else is collecting users data while we are just basically the only thing we just want to know how many users we have. Right. That's that's basically it. Right. Um, now, regarding third parties, um, have you have you seen privacytests.org? Yes. Um, so brought and, and I, I, this is why I like to ask people because there's probably a lot more nuance because privacytest.org I think is a great resource, but also like all these resources have to have nuance. For example, they say there's no Tor routing in Brave, for example, but Brave has a Tor routing window. It's just not by default utilized, so therefore it fails the test. If you look at privacytest.org, Vivaldi doesn't perform as well as some of the other browsers. So do you mind expanding on some of those third, maybe those third party protections and why by default a tool like Privacy Test would show Vivaldi not performing as well? I'm, I'm genuinely asking for myself as well. Actually, it's because it's run by Brave. I mean, the guy that that owns it, uh, that owns the site, he works at Brave. Now he tries to say that he, it's it's kind of has nothing to do with Brave at all, but he works for Brave. and. I think in a way, I mean, if you're working for a competitor in the field and you're putting out a site that is supposed to be independent, I would put the name of the company in big letters on the front page and say, this, this, is, this is who we are, this is what we put out, this is how we compare to our competitors, not, okay, this is an independent test, I'm comparing kind of with the different browsers and the like. So. That's, I mean, he uh, chooses to run the test with all security uh, kind of privacy uh, tracker blockers and ad blockers off in Vivaldi. At Vivaldi, we asked you, we want you to decide what it is that you want to have on or off in the beginning. And he chooses then to run all the tests with all those off so it's it, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy uh and i've tried to talk to them about this that this is kind of unethical to do uh but i guess they don't think like that right so that's the nuance i was trying to get into so you're saying the reason why it doesn't perform the same is because they have the tracking protections off for vivaldi yes got it okay so that's that was kind of my assumption because i think earlier for some for whatever reason I was on the website or something, but it's like, I think there was something that hinted at you can enable. It might have been on your actual website that was saying you can enable tracking protection, which made it sound like it wasn't on by default, which then kind of answered some of my questions behind why. Because again, there's other things too, where there are other browsers there that it shows things are missing, but it's like, no, you can actually have those things there. They're just not on by default, for example. Um, yep. So that's good to know. Uh, regarding the, the Chromium dependence, um, I'm not inherently someone that thinks that just because something's based on Chromium, it's bad or anything like that. I definitely see the arguments that people make about how um, it could be detrimental in the long run to have a huge monopoly that's based on Chromium, which Google has a lot of control over. But um, I also understand that it is, in many ways, one of the most sophisticated and one of the best web engines out there, and it's also one of the most compatible on the internet. So what made you all, have you always been based on Chromium? Um, have, do you want to continue staying on Chromium and why do you continue to use Chromium? Personally, I exclusively use, almost exclusively use Chromium based browsers because I prefer them, but, um, just for some insight, cause I know some people are like staunchly Firefox only. Sure. I mean, uh, obviously I built a browser from scratch before, right? We did that at Opera. That's the code base that was thrown away after I left the company. Uh, personally, I think it was the best code base of the ones available. Uh, I think it's a really an unfortunate thing that it got thrown away and it was a quality piece of code. But I also then realized how much effort it takes to maintain one. Uh, we had a hundred people working on that code base to just to maintain it. Um, and that's one of the things that I was quarreling with the uh, 
kind of the investors on the like we, because they didn't see the value in doing that. I wanted us to put more resources into it. They they decided to kill it. Um, so, okay, I couldn't use the engine that I wanted to. Uh, then I was basically left with two. It's either Chromium or Gecko. Um, and then it's, if you're betting your company on something, because it kind of is a big bet which engine you would take, would you take the engine that most everyone else is using? Or would you take the engine that only Mozilla more or less is using. And in some ways, I mean, I would be more aligned with Mozilla, uh, but it wasn't a choice that we could take. I mean, it felt that uh, Chromium was the better code base at the time. Mozilla was going through a fairly uh, significant re reorg of the code. Uh, I think that's a very dangerous time to, to jump onto it. So we didn't really have a choice we we felt that we had to choose chromium and and by the way the way we are using the browser the user interface on the desktop sites is web web based so we have to kind of the, the code the code that we're running on has to be really good and again the sandboxing and the like the, all, all of those things matter a lot with regards to ensuring the security of the browser so we felt that that was the best choice. And I don't really see that, I mean, 10 years later, uh, almost since we, we made that choice, the, the feeling is, okay, this is was the right choice. Uh, sadly, uh, Mozilla has lost some grounds um, uh, and, and some user base. And so Mozilla and Gecko is a smaller part of the, the market. So, and and obviously since then Microsoft has jumped on on this ship as well. So it it feels like this was the right decision given also how things have progressed. Right. It's 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 re a really tough situation. And you know, looking back on it, I'm sure now, especially ten years later, um, I'm sure that you're seeing you know Mozilla kind of not really supporting more web based things. Um, and dropping some better support for web-based things, which Chromium continues to improve. And also a lot of the sandboxing and security, like you talked about, seem to be stronger on Chromium as well than what Firefox provides. Um, but it, it just kind of sucks, you know? Um, like it's a sucky situation because you are trying to build a browser and like you said, you have to make a bet on something so that you can exist in 10 years and feel confident in that. And meanwhile, because everyone's doing that, like it, it gets worse and worse for Firefox, which is really just a sucky situation, I think, all around. But it sounds like for you, that was by far the best thing to do. If I was to make a browser right now, I don't, I also don't know why I would make it gecko based either. It'd be hard to justify that, unless it was a very niche use case, not for the intent of necessarily growing a huge user base. Um, something like Molvad's new browser, it's gecko based, but it, it's there to serve a very, very niche specific use case for people who are kind of wanting a Tor browser without routing through Tor, which is extremely niche, all things considered. Um, so I think that was really good stuff. And as someone who loves web-based stuff, like I, I kind of despise using a lot of Gecko-based browsers. <laughs> mm. And I think, I mean, uh, when it comes to, again, when it comes to the user interface and the like, we made this choice to do it web-based. And, and by the way, which actually means that you can go in and you can kind of debug and do changes to the UI. And that's something that our users are making. And and we feel that's a very nice thing to be able to do as a company. And and, and again, it's, it's part of the choices that we made. We wanted to make something that was very flexible. We want our users to be able to tailor it in, in the best possible way. And, and this is kind of all part of that. Well, these interviews are unsponsored. We don't get any direct financial incentive from it. Like sure, there's some ads here, but really what keeps us able to do these independent interviews with so many cool privacy projects is the fact that we are pretty much completely viewer funded, which means that you can support this as well. We are on Patreon, which is probably the best way of supporting us. So if you like these kind of interviews where we dive into things and we're able to do these independently, Check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash techlore. Massively helps us out. And we also have many other support methods like LibraPay, Monero, and we also even have free support methods as well. So if you like what we do here and you like the TechLore Talks podcast and you like hearing from these privacy projects, make sure to support us down below as well. I see a lot about Vivaldi and I think the main thing I see that prevents at least more of the hardcore people in the privacy community from hopping on is the source code situation. So I wanted to get more insight into that because um, as far last I read, Vivaldi is source available. 
Yeah, I mean the way the way it works is so basically we are Chromium based. So any changes to the Chromium code we share. So everything on the C plus plus side we are sharing. Uh, then when it comes to the web based interface, uh, there isn't an open license to use that. We have been discussing what to do with that because in some ways we'd like to be as open as possible, and we actually in some ways even encourage people to make changes to the browser and share their uh, creations. Uh, and and people are doing that. Uh, so, but I, I think what you have there, you have the code base which is C plus plus, and you can go and audit it and have a look at it. At the same time, you can do the same with the HTML code, because the UI. So all the code is readable, but you can't take it and and create a, a competitor. And it's it's a question of okay, should we do thing. that? It's it's a licensing thing more than anything else. Anyone can do have a look at it, and we are not going to be kind of if someone wants to to do hacks on the code and and the like, they can go and do that, and they do in, in primarily on the user interface code, which is where you would I would expect people to want to do changes. It's actually easier because it's JavaScript and CSS and HTML. It's easy to go and do those changes. And people do, and you find a number of these mods listed in our forums where people are discussing them. So we, we, we have a lot of discussions with users on kind of uh, and a lot of active users doing changes and discussing with us. But again, we haven't provided the license. Uh, we are always having discussions on it. Is it a way? Is there a way we could do that where we would feel comfortable? Um, so far, we haven't found a way, but it's it's coming back because there's a lot of people inside the company that would like to go there. Right. Um, and so for someone who's listening to this podcast and, you know, they are, uh, you know, a staunch open source advocate and they want to use Vivaldi, but they can't get over the fact that it's not, I guess, by formal definition, open source. I guess, what would, what would you say to them? Um, because I'm not quite that staunch on the open source boat. I do use some proprietary software. If I have two things and one's open source and they're equivalent, more or less, in the feature side of things, I'm always going to pick the open source option. But I also like to remember that open source is all about mainly transparency more than anything. And if you're still supplying the source code, I don't see the privacy or security issue with that necessarily. So I guess, what are your personal thoughts and what would you say to someone who's like, I can't use Vivaldi because it's not technically open source? Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, like you said, you can look at the code. You can you can have a look at, at, at any parts of the code. It's all there. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, kind of should be enough for most users. Th there will be a group of people that will not accept us. And I think it's unfortunate because I do feel that those are the users that probably would feel most at home in Vivaldi in many ways. I mean, we have a very strong support on Linux. Uh, so my feeling is that there is a, a strong kind of uh, tie between us and the Linux community. And, and a lot of us are Linux fans and the like. And I think there's a, most Linux users would welcome us, but there's a group of people that because we don't have the right license, then they won't accept us. But then there is the fact that there is the second argument, by the way, and we know about that argument as well. So if we were to open source, there would still be the argument, but you're Chromium. Yep. It's it's hard to please everyone in the privacy world, which I'm sure you so, know. <laughs> so it's 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 kind of like we we wouldn't get everyone even if we were to provide a license. So it's it's difficult. Uh, but I mean, I think people that know us and that have looked into what we are doing and they like they like what we are doing. And and, and again, I mean. I think a lot of our users, they have this thinking, okay, we trust Vivaldi, but we also verify. And I think that's really where, what I recommend people to do in general uh, when it comes to any company, whether it's open source or not, because I mean, you, you look at uh, open source companies and, and, and they can do bad things just like anyone else. So it's, it's, it's a question of basically trust but verify. And I think that's what you find our users are doing. They, they like what we are doing, but they will still put on sniffers on, on the communication to verify that what we are saying about communication with our servers and the like is true. Right. And it's not hard to disprove claims like we only collect the number sure. of users. That's a very easy thing for someone, anyone who downloads Vivaldi to go ahead and verify. Uh, basi basically. Uh, so so I think, I mean, that's that's what people do. They have a look at how we communicate and the like. Right. And like you said, the code base is 
public as well, essentially. Yes. Right. Yes. That's really cool. Um, so thank you for adding perspective. And I hope that, I mean, I'm not necessarily doing this interview to sell people on Vivaldi. It's just, I like to have people on here so they can share their voice and why they have their product and why they think their product is good. And I do think that some of the criticisms that I see don't make much sense. But like you said too, it's really hard to please people because if you went completely open source, um, people are still going to complain that you're Chromium based. But then even if you move over to, you know, you look at Firefox, people still complain about things that Firefox does as well, which are all, so you just can't please anyone. Um, <laughs> everyone, not anyone. Yep. <laughs> no, we're, we're trying our best. And I think, I mean, what we are doing is, and, and I think this is where we are unique. We are listening to our users. We are actually putting in features that people are asking for. We're not afraid to put in power feature, power user features. Uh, and actually it's been interesting to me is to see after we launched and gradually seeing others putting in some of the same things, right? So, okay, we put in tab stacking, someone else puts in tab stacking. We put in tab tiling, someone else puts in tab tiling. We put, we have panels, browsers are starting to have panels again. Uh, so things like that. So I, I feel, I mean, even, even things like being able to take screenshots of pages. I mean, we have the capability to put uh, take a screenshot of parts of the page or the whole page, even including things that, that is invisible. So we put in that functionality, then you'll find that some of the, our competitors have put in some similar functionality. So this is the way I like it to be. I want us to be ahead of the others. I want us to be the ones that come with the technology and then, okay, I know we'll be copied, but that's okay because we have plenty of new ideas uh, and we'll continue kind of moving as quickly as we can. And and, and again, it's, it's about adapting to the individual needs and I, and I believe this is unique. Everyone else is basically utilizing data to decide what the functionality should be like. While we have decided, okay, we'll listen to users, we'll use our own heads, we'll get the feedback from users. And and and, and by the way, as a company, we we have volunteers. I mean, we have volunteers helping us test, we have volunteers helping us, uh, and they give us a lot of really good feedback. Some of them really deep dive into issues when we've been struggling with something difficult, they'll help us get through it. They help us translate, and then they even help spread the word. And again, this is the reason why we started Vivaldi, because I felt I owed the people that had done similar things for us at, at Opera. We had grown the company to be quite sizable, through the help of those users and i felt i owed them and and for me that's the special thing is this close relationship we have with our user base uh and and again i, I love the fact that we are kind of making something special for them i was now on a trip in japan um we had a user gathering there were people coming from everywhere in japan tra kind of traveling hours they were demonstrating very advanced use of Vivaldi. Uh, they did it in Japanese, but I, someone was translating a little bit of kind of, okay, this is roughly what he was saying. There was even one that had made a Vivaldi song. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel this is special. If you, if if people are doing this for you and, and they love your products this much, you have to be doing something right. And that's kind of where I'm coming from. I, I really want to provide the the best possible product for people and listen to their needs. Basically, instead of having investors that are pushing us to, okay, you have to find a new way to kind of get that extra time. We have people on the other side and inside the company, which will rather say, okay, we have to stay on the straight and narrow. And that's really, really important. And that's, I mean, that's how it should be. On the topic of your community, I wanted to ask, uh... You all opened a Mastodon home server not too long ago. Um, so for those listening, Mastodon is federated. Um, it's not like Twitter where you just log in and create an account. With Mastodon, you have to choose a home server, and then everything's federated, so all these different home servers can chat with each other. Do you mind expanding on your decision or why you guys opened the Mastodon home server? Yeah, I mean, it, it, in many ways, this starts with ActivityPub. So ActivityPub is a W3C standard for doing basic social networking online. Uh, and it's distributed and no one owns it. And that's kind of what we love about it, right? So it's, for me, it's, it's kind of like, okay, the web has been growing. 
but there's been certain things that have been going in the wrong direction. And it's the closed systems, these uh, social networks in particular. Uh, so what we are seeing with Mastodon and with the Fediverse, because it's more than just Mastodon, there is a movement towards a distributed system where there's, again, no one owns the system. There is, uh, in most of the systems you find there, there isn't ads. There's basically very simple algorithms in use that just say, okay, whoever posted last comes at the top of the people that you follow. You're not getting other content into your feeds and the like. And, and we wanted to support that. So we thought, okay, we can provide a very simple way for any of our users to join. Because if they already have an account, they'll automatically get an account in the new system. Uh, I mean, they have to set up the account, by the way. There is, we don't generate automatically. It's just a very simple sign-on. Because we, we didn't want to create accounts for everyone because some people definitely wouldn't like that. So it's still a choice for users if they want to join or not. But but it's very easy for them to do that. And we want to support this. And I would like uh, to urge everyone else to do the same. Because I think this is, um, in many ways, it's Elon Musk telling everyone, guys, this is how badly you can run a company. This is how if someone gets in, it gets into power here, uh, he can do whatever he wants to do. So if I don't like NPR or I don't like BBC, I can just say that they are state-owned, state-controlled, whatever. So people should take a hint and they should set up an account. They don't have to close their other accounts, but I think they should set up an account. I mean, there are reasons not to, to, to give up your account because someone else can take it, which is ridiculous. Some, that you, If you give up your account, someone else can just take it. Um, but if you should set up an account uh, on, 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 on the mass, uh, one, one of the Mastodon servers, or if you're an institution or you like, you should set up your own server. And that's really where the beauty of the system comes into play. Because, because it's a distributed system. Yes, you can set up on your Vivaldi.net account, which our users will do. But what I'd like to see, I'd like to see an NPR account. I'd like to see a BBC account. And more than an account, I'd like to see a server. Because then you can identify all those people that are working there, journalists and the like. They could automatically, they get their blue kind of check mark or whatever. They're basically recognized as working for this company. And, and, and it's a beautiful system that way. And I'm hope, kind of waiting for the next wave for people to join. Uh, there is obviously some people are looking at other solutions like Blue Sky and the like. But to me, that's another closed system. It's there's nothing about it by... yet. No, and it's also just it's not open standards for me. An open standard needs to be not controlled by a single company. And that's basically what you have with ActivityPub. It's it's a W3C standard. For me, it's that's the golden standard. Anything that's W3C, that's that's the best you can get. And and I would like to go with that and support that. Right. And I've actually never considered that before because um, for those listening, what this would look like is something like NPR could create their own Mastodon home server. So it would be you know journalist A at npr.org or whatever their domain is but then it's kind of like their website um, because you yes. know you're on npr.org because it's npr.org and you can verify that so there is no required verification process because you see the actual home server that belongs to them i never considered that i never really thought that like owning your own home server really is verification of your identity because it's tied to your domain on the website but it is it's pretty cool mm. um also i just wanted to like outline here because i feel like we have communities. We don't have our own matrix home server, but we do host our own forum. And we are on Mastodon, but we don't host our own home server. And we have Discord. We've had matrix in the past for our communities. These things aren't free to run. They cost a lot of time to moderate. They cost money to host. Um, and we have to deal with a ton of abuse back here. And I'm sure you guys do as well. You have to deal with tons of problems in these communities. And so it's not just like, you know, John is just doing this and there's actually a lot of benefit to them. Um, it's a really nice offering to just go out there and do something like host a home server. So I appreciate that. And I'm sure most of the uh, Macedon and all of the activity pub community appreciates that because it's not an easy thing to do. It's a big task to take on. Sure. 
No, we were very proud to be able to set up a server very quickly. And obviously we built a server to be able to handle quite a lot of loads. So I, I think that's that's kind of the way to do it. And again, we are trying to support anyone that wants to join, uh, basically providing a Mastodon server for those. But I still think that, uh, again, the NPR and the BBC and those, they should have their own servers because again, the identification and and it, it takes it to a different level and, and and you can follow anyone on any server uh, unless the server is something that gets blocked uh, fully i mean that, right. again exactly. that can ha that that can happen i mean it's it's kind of interesting how the system works because you as a user you can uh, decide if you want to block a person or block a server or the like and 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 then in a way the the person that is hosting that server can do the same uh, but you also have the capability to move from one server to another, which is really great. So if you find out that your server no longer, you don't like the guy who's running it, because a lot of the, the servers actually today are run by by basically individuals. Uh, and if you find out that the, the guy that's running your server, you don't like his moderation or the like, you just move to the next one. And it's, it's, it's rather simple. And I mean, I, I think it's the way that the uh, social network should be working. To kind of start wrapping this up, I think we're kind of getting to the end here. I have two, you know, most of this interview, I've asked more broad questions, a, some of them for myself, but mostly, as you know, trying to put myself in the um, mindset of maybe a viewer who's never heard of Vivaldi to try to give people more insight. But I do have a couple more personal questions that, you know, this might apply to some people out there and they might be saying, wow, thank you, Henry, for asking that. I was wondering that the whole time, but these are more for myself, if anything. Um, one thing that I'm always following is uh, speeding it. So I'm, I'm in a situation where um, I am slightly concerned about things like zero days, um, and I want to make sure I'm always on top of my security. Um, pretty high threat model for security wise, given I'm a public figure and I have thousands of people online who can do as much as they want to me. Um, how well does Vivaldi keep up with Chromium security patches? That's always something I'm looking at. I mean, we're we we, are, we are fast. Um, I think when it comes to the big releases, uh, it can take, I mean, typically a week or two be before we have it ready. When there's actually just new security uh, kind of issues that come up, we, we normally have it inside 24 hours. So normally it's a 24 hour window. Uh, typically, if there's, if, if there's a security issue, uh, there's a zero day. We pride ourselves in in kind of having it out as quickly. I think the closest we've got is like 20 minutes. Uh, and I mean, I mean, we have to build this across a lot of platforms and 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 the like. So no, we have very dedicated people. We understand that this is important, and we basically, as soon as there's something reported, uh, I mean. Typically, we know about it before everyone else, but as soon as an, anyone posts something, they're saying, okay, there is something happening, you have to do it. So we are monitoring it and our users are monitoring it and we just get things out as soon as possible. And I think we're pretty much faster than most out there. Awesome, thank you for the insight. And um, the other thing I wanted to ask, this is more of just prying because you might not even have an answer here, um, or I don't know if you're allowed to talk about it. Um, I, I'm trying to get more information from people. I've actually talked to someone who works on the WebKit team, um, and they, they just tell me I can't talk about it. I'm like, ah, um, which is expected. But um, now that the you know this whole thing in the EU is going on and they're planning to drop the WebKit requirement on iOS, are you guys looking at that? Is there anything you can talk about regarding that? Um, I don't know if, um, I, you know, it's been pretty much confirmed that Google is internally working on Chromium for iOS. So I don't know if you're also kind of on that boat or if you're planning to stay with WebKit or if it's way too early to even tell what's going to happen on iOS. Actually, the reason why our iOS version has taken so long is we've been waiting on this to change, to be frank. So there's no iOS Vivaldi? Uh, not yet. Oh, I didn't know actually. That. I didn't know. Okay, good to know. So, so we were waiting for basically. We didn't want to have to do it on WebKit. Eventually, we relented and said, "Okay, we our users really, really want this. They're all asking for it. We can't wait anymore." I mean, it is a question also of resources. We, are, I mean, we are a small company in comparison to a lot of these guys. So it's a question of where do we put our resources. But we said, "Okay, we, we'll put out the iOS version." There is now a test flight available. People are very enthusiastic about that. It's, it's WebKit based. 
once uh, we are able to do it without using WebKit, uh, our goal would be to, to offer that. I mean, I'm following pretty closely what's happening with the Digital Markets Act. And I think a lot of people are maybe not realizing how big a deal it is. Uh, I think it's, for me, it's kind of, it's the culmination of years where the EU has been dealing with Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, and the like, basically doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And I mean, this goes all the way back to the Netscape days. And and um, by the way, there was a browser choice at a certain time in Europe. That's because of a protest that we at Opera came with. Um, and, and now this basically push that Apple has to allow other browser engines. There's also the push to allow web applications to be uh, run as native so applications on that. the platform. I don't, know, yes. I don't know if you've seen any of our content, but in like every video, I have to bring up web apps because I just love web apps. Everything I do is in the web. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I can tell you, by the way, there's, there's some of the first web apps were the, the specifications was written by Opera during my time at Opera. <laughs> it used to be called widgets, but it was basically web applications in a window. I mean, that's uh, we were particularly focusing on, on on mobile, but also in general. But that's a little bit of a sidestep. But this is something we're excited about. Also, the ability to have multiple app stores, uh, ability to download directly to the phone. I mean, this is just focusing on the uh, iPhone. There is on on Windows the basic uh, basically it's supposed to be equal for the browsers. So if you look at now, you want to install another browser, Microsoft will warn you multiple times on the way that you are you sure you don't want to use the Microsoft recommended browser or settings or whatever, and then they provide an update to the operating system and suddenly they've changed the default browser again. So there's a, there's a lot of things like this, but for all these companies, uh, the new ruling is that they have to start behaving. Also with Google, I mean, in the past, we've had to deal with both at Opera and at Vivaldi uh, being blocked uh, from using certain services or getting recommendations. Google Docs doesn't work well with your browser. You should consider an upgrade or something like that. Uh, so it, it applies to a lot of the services and I think it can make a significant difference. And I think, I mean, it's, it's a really good thing. So I think the EU is taking some very important steps and one of the more important ones, as you mentioned, is, is the ability to use another browser core. For us, when we are building the browser uh, available for the iOS, I mean, one thing we have to do the user interface in a different way, we would have preferred to use the same browser technology across the platforms. We, we did run into issues on Android, so we couldn't use web technology for Android for the user interface, um, not in the way that we had thought we would. And I guess we would have run into the same issues on iOS. But the issue when we're using the core, um, when we have Chromium, we can modify it. When we have WebKit, we can't. Basically, it's not just, OK, you have to use that code or that code. It's a question of, in the case of the WebKit on iOS, it's a black box. We can't change it. And for certain things, we need to do changes to the core. And obviously, we'd like to be able to look at what it's doing in, in greater detail. But in particular, for things like tracker blocker and the like, trying to get that black box to do tracker blocking in the best possible way is a significant amount of work. Now, we managed to do it, but it's extra work that we do differently on the Chromium code base where we modify the code to do what we need. So it's, it's those kind of things that make it a lot more difficult. So we are very excited about the ability to be using Chromium directly on iOS as well. Super cool. Now, that was a lot of great insight that I haven't heard from anyone yet, actually. So thank you very much for that. And um, do you think, just personally, that the EU, my concern, um, I, I don't know how valid it is. My concern is that, you know, these companies are going to do the bare minimum and start releasing EU only like these things will only apply to the EU. Do you think that this will apply globally? Apple's not going to want to have a version of iOS for the whole world except the EU where you're still stuck on WebKit? Or do you think they're just going to eventually just open this up to the entire world? I would expect them to open up. Uh, I mean, that's, and I also think, by the way, there is a very important clause in the Digital Markets Act, which is the anti-circumvention clause. 
uh, which basically means if you try to find a way to get around the, the regulation, you will be fined double. Uh, and I mean, we are talking about, as far as I understand, up to 20% of global revenues. So I would hope, I mean, basically uh, what the EU is trying to let these companies do is to behave. I mean, and, and I think, I mean, for, for us as a, I mean, we have been pushing for this comes to things like privacy and the like. I mean, when it comes to the Kingdom Markets Act focus a lot on just competition and, and we've dealt with competition with these guys for a long time. And I can tell you they don't play fair, right? So it's a basically a question of, okay, in a competitive environment, you have to follow certain rules for the competitive environment to work. But we are going further than that. And, and I mean, we are pushing for uh, basically uh, reducing the use of data. Um, you want to have, might want to have a look at bandspying.org. We made a cat video to get our point through. But basically what we are trying to say, this is outside of the scope of the Digital Markets Act, but what we're trying to say, basically, we would like to see that uh, you can't use user data for other purposes than what you need to provide the service. So let's say you have car data, for example. You can utilize that for the car service, but you can't use it to profile your users. And that's really something that we think should be regulated and, uh, and something that we are pushing for as well. So we talk to the EU and they obviously they know me because I've been talking to them for a long time. No um, <laughs> I mean, uh, we subtle, again, subtle we, 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 we <laughs> well, it happens to be some of the same people that actually we talked to when we took the case against Microsoft, which led to the choice screen. Uh, so it's it's for me, it's I, I don't like bragging. It's 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 a question of just uh, a, a, a matter. Um, I, I know <laughs> it's a matter of fact that that basically uh, they know who we are and what we've been doing, uh, not only from Vivaldi, but from from Opera. And I think they value our opinion. That doesn't mean that they always go as far as I'd like to see. I've struggled with getting through this uh, this ruling on on basically not collecting data. I think there's a concern uh, that if they don't allow the level of data usage, that that would be bad for European companies. At least that's the message that that basically big tech is is pushing that it would be bad for small and medium-sized companies if they're not allowed to collect data and that basically ad systems would break and the like which in my humble opinion is not true um, we, we talked a little bit i mean i have the history here uh, and when it comes to ad systems and the like in the early days of the internet everything was built on ads and, and people will try to tell you that kind of ads are so important and I would agree that ads are important, but it's the context sensitive ads that the internet was built on, not the surveillance based ads. So the context sensitive ads, they, so they, those are the ones you go to a tech site and you see tech ads and you go to a fashion site and you see fashion ads. You don't visit some site and then you see ads for it everywhere where you go afterwards. So it's, it, it's a different level uh, and, and the level of collect data from multiple sources isn't there. So I think, I mean, the EU is following up on this. They've been kind of, there's discussions on Google Analytics and the like, because again, you're getting data from very many different sources. So I think that's important. Um, that's a yeah. super important nuance as well, because we see this in the privacy community. You know, you have search engines like DuckDuckGo, StartPage, um, and they use contextual advertising. You search for um, baby diapers and you get an advertisement maybe related to babies. That makes sense. It's just tied to that one search. If you open a fresh new incognito window and you type in um, men's shirts, you're going to get ads for men's shirts. It's not going to give you baby ads. Um, but people still think that it's a privacy concern. But ads don't have to be privacy invasive inherently. Um, and yeah, it's it's sad that like I think people think the reality is there has to be invasive advertising, which is just not the reality. Um, it didn't used to be that way. We had TV advertisements that were the furthest thing from individualized advertising. It was global advertising that was done per show. If you were watching a horror show, you're going to get advertising that's tied to people watching that show. So 
yeah, I'm really glad you touched on that and didn't expect the conversation to go there, but it's definitely a good one. And I think it's a good thing to harp on um, for things here. Um, those are kind of all the things that I needed to talk about. Is there anything that you want to um, share with people before we kind of start um, finalizing this? Is there anything that you want to share with our community or just the privacy community in general? I think, I mean, we covered a lot of the ground and I would just like to add to that a little bit on the ad side, basically. Again, I think this is important. I also would like people to be on the watch for uh, ideas where you collect data in the browser. Again, this is the flock and the topic kind of uh, solutions where the idea is, okay, you you, you basically collect the, the data on the machine and then supposedly that is not shared with the outside or whatever. But I mean, for me, the problem with the ad systems are, they are, that are today, it's not about the individual's data so much as uh, the, con uh, the impact on society. And I think in a way the ability to learn a lot about the individuals and send specialized messaging based on whatever content you view. So anything that looks at your content is a, is a problem. And that basically tries to understand who you are and how you can be manipulated to do things that you otherwise wouldn't be doing. And that's kind of, uh, again, why I think it's really important that that kind of data collection and usage is banned. And, and, and even though we, I mean, we are not, doing this and we've said we will stop flock and topic in our code base and, and and the like i still think this is important because i guess um the way i view it it's kind of being like in a zombie movie right so if all the vivaldi users are not eaten by zombies there's still a lot of other people that are and that's a sad state of the world right you want everyone to be safe not just our users and that's why we are fighting for regulation instead of just saying okay come and use vivaldi and you'll be safe Right. That's a very massive problem in the privacy world. I think a lot of people are very self-centered. They think about themselves and that's good. Like I want people to take their own safety seriously and their own privacy and security seriously, but also there's a much more global problem here. And this is why I say like if we could in just very simplified example, if the whole world moved to Signal, that's a lot more impactful than you hardening your Firefox browser as on a societal level. Um, and so it's those little but global steps that make a much bigger difference. And when you were talking about this, I wasn't even thinking about necessarily the advertising industry because you were talking about being, being manipulated and fed things. I was thinking more of just algorithmic content in general. Uh, YouTube, which is probably where a lot of people are watching this on, that's a serious problem. YouTube has direct incentive to keep you on the platform as long as possible. And it does that through algorithms, which are designed to understand who you are and what triggers you in both either negative or positive ways. You find this on Facebook, Twitter, pretty much every social media platform. It's why I like Mastodon so much. It's only timeline based. There is no algorithm. It's fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's a very serious issue. And it's one that people don't seem to see a problem with. Um, I see a lot of people say, I like the YouTube algorithm because I want to find things to watch. But there's a whole hidden dark side to that i mean in particular and and, and again i mean uh, there is the facebook kind of documents that basically said okay we know that uh, our algorithms make people hate each other but they generate engagement so let's keep them and, and i'm just thinking okay if i had written that algorithm i would have changed it pretty quickly you don't want to be the one that is responsible for people not being able to have Christmas and Thanksgiving together without fighting. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy. Right. And their mission statement is to connect the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, John, uh, I really appreciate this time here. As someone who I think is overall probably a, a huge noob to Vivaldi, you really helped me understand the project. And I'm guessing that you really helped um, a lot of people here understand the project as well. Um, where can people reach you if they want to reach you? Or where can they reach Vivaldi if they want to engage with Vivaldi? Well, I mean, they can reach us on, on Macedon, they can reach us on Twitter, they can uh, basically go to vialde.com, go to our forums and discuss with us there. We're very active there as well. So plenty of places to, to reach Vivaldi and, and uh, yeah, find us. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John. 
Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. And with all of that said, I want to thank John for his time in coming on this podcast. I know he's probably very busy. And so it's really awesome that he took time out of his day to share his project and what he does and some of his personal thoughts on the world with all of you. I also want to thank all of you who tuned in and uh, are opening yourselves up to learning things and uh, taking your privacy more seriously is my assumption as to why you're here. But if you're not, make sure that you check out some of our other privacy resources. That's really the main thing we do back here. So um, if you really like privacy and you want to learn more about privacy and security, we have tons of resources on our website and here on the YouTube channel, as well as the podcast and many other cool things that we work on. Again, these interviews aren't like sponsored or paid for in really any capacity. Um, we pretty much just reach out or people people who are cool reach out to us depending on how it happens but pretty much if there's a cool interview and I see an opportunity for an interview I'm like hey let's get an interview going um, and so if you like this kind of independent stuff where we can pretty much just ask free open questions to anyone we want in a very unscripted format make sure to join our patreon at patreon.com slash tech lore um, you can see some of the names on the bottom of the screen of people who support our work and you can be one of those people as well thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time on tech lore and stay safe out there everyone